It is a dark and gloomy day, my friends. I'm here today with a cup of tea, pretending it's autumn, but really it's the last day of August. And look at me on time with my August wrap up this month. In fact, early, early, because the month is not even over, but I'm not gonna read another book today. So I thought that I would film this today. And I have 21 books to talk to you about. I read some of the best books that I've read so far this year, this month. I also read the worst book that I've read in I don't know how long. So let's get into it. This is too hot to drink. So by the time I finish filming this, maybe it will be drinkable. So August was, is, because it's still August, August is Women in Translation Month. So this is a month where you are encouraged to read work by women in translation bonus points if the translator is also a woman. So I did a reading vlog right at the beginning of the month where I read a book a day over the course of a week. And so I have those seven books here and I'm not gonna talk to you about them in depth because I spoke about them in that video, which I'll link up here and down below. But a quick rundown. A DNF for me was The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Mass and this is translated from the French by Frank Wynne. This is a Victorian novel set in Paris and it's supposed to be a really atmospheric book about women who have been locked up but deemed hysterical and then a ball occurs once a year where people can come and essentially just stare at them. But I found this not full of atmosphere. Um, I didn't find the world building believable and I found it just a very disjointed reading experience. So I stopped reading that one. Then I read three pamphlets published by Strangers Press, who are a small independent publisher who publish work in translation. So I read uh, Bay Suez, Milena, Milena Static. I read Friendship for Grownups um, by Naokoli Yamazaki, translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. And this one is translated by Janet Hong. And then I also read a Dutch book, which is Something Has to Happen by Marjo Wartel. And this is translated by Joseph Vandervoort. And I really enjoyed all three of these pamphlets. And if you haven't checked out this publisher, I really, really recommend doing so because they're a great way to sample stories by writers whose work you may then want to delve into. I definitely want to purchase a novel by Bay Sewer, having read this book because it was just so delightful and slightly creepy and just all the kind of things that I, I like. So if you wanna hear more about those, head over to my reading vlog. I also really enjoyed this book by Lenia Rodriguez Inglesias, which is called A Little Body Are Many Parts. And this is translated from the Spanish by Abigail Parry and Serafina Vick. Um, Lenia is a Cuban poet. And I wouldn't say that I enjoyed this on a consistent level throughout, but there were standout poems for me. And I think maybe it's not surprising that that's the case because this is a selection of her work from eight different collections. So if I was reading one full length collection of poems that were always supposed to be together, it would have more of a, a narrative feel to it or, or perhaps there would be similar imagery linking everything together. But this was a great sample for her work and I hope that more of it has been translated actually. A book I really didn't enjoy was this one by Ludmilla Petraskevsia and it's translated from the Russian by Anna Summers. Unfortunately, the thing that I loved most about this book is the title, which is There Once Lived a Mother Who Loved Her Children Until They Moved Back In. Again, if you wanna hear my thoughts, you can head over to the vlog, but I thought it was going to be like Angela Carter, but it's just not, the two do not compare in the slightest. And then I love The Child by Kirsty A. Scomsfold. This is a piece of autofiction, it's quite short. And in this, she is addressing her second child who she's just given birth to, but she's talking to her second child about the birth of her first child and everything she was thinking about the first time all of the things that she had to consider as a woman trying to get back to work and how she is both prepared and not prepared to go through that again and just being very honest with this newborn, which I thought was rather enchanting and delightful. So I enjoyed that one a lot. At the end of that video, where is the book? Here it is. At the end of that video, because I hadn't enjoyed um, the Mad Woman's Ball and I DNF'd it and I'd finished all the others, I had decided that I would pick up an eighth book. So I started reading this at the end of that vlog, which is Flowers of Mold by Ha Song Nan and it's translated from the Korean by Janet Hong. And I 
really love this book. I thought it was going to be my favourite short story collection that I had read in years. And I think I thought that for about the first third half of the book and then I didn't enjoy the rest as much. There was nothing in it that I that I hated, but I just was not as in love with the prose as I was for the first three or four stories. I read a few sentences from this book out in that vlog if you would like to hear the book in action, but essentially I think the first line of the blurb perfectly sums up the feeling, the eeriness of this book when it says, on the surface, Hasong Nang's stories seem pleasant enough, yet there's something disturbing just below the surface, ready to permanently disrupt the characters' lives. And if I can take that imagery slightly further and a bit in a gross direction, think about if you accidentally cut yourself shaving or something and you think nothing of it, it's a very insignificant event, and then later you're getting undressed for bed and you realise that the wound has become like terribly infected and suddenly this thing that seems really insignificant is is a very big deal that is what happens to these characters they'll meet someone and it seems like it's not consequential at all and then their life will be turned upside down so one woman meets someone else who lives in her apartment building who she's never seen before who comes around one day and asks if she can borrow a spatula and she thinks well that's fine, I'll lend you a spatula. But then suddenly this woman is in your life forever. It's almost like the spatula was a pact that you made with some kind of devil and there is no escaping it. You are now bound to this human being by the means of kitchen utensils. It's really funny in places too. There is one story where two characters unbeknownst to each other are both plotting to kill the other one <laughs> and it's just a bit ridiculous but mostly they're quite slow introspective and have that simmering darkness the thing that i think made me fall out of love with it slightly is that it came to feel a little bit repetitive and some of that's deliberate with reoccurring characters but i felt like we were stomping over ground that we had perfectly mowed and decorated and we're we're, we're ruining um, I'm going to stop it with the extended metaphors now, but this I really did enjoy, even though I didn't end up loving it quite as much as I thought I would at the beginning, and I look forward to reading more work by this author. Shall we continue with the women in translation? Because I did read a couple of others. Sadly, these also were not hugely exciting to me. So I read Banana Yoshimoto's Moshi Moshi, and I hadn't read a book by her in absolute years. The last one I think I read was, is there one called The Lake? It's been that long that I do not remember. But I particularly love NP, which is a book about translation. Um, and I did like Kitchen back in the day, but I don't think that would hold up to a reread. It's been at least 10 years since I read that. This is translated from the Japanese by Asa Yanida, who I know is the translator for Picnic in the Storm, which is a short story collection that I really enjoyed and read. A year or two ago. So this, I thought the premise sounded really intriguing. It's about uh, a woman in her 20s and her father has died, but he died by suicide in this pact with a woman he was having an affair with. And the narrator and her mother didn't know that their father, husband, was, was having an affair. So not only has he died, but they've got this this huge thing that's tainting their memory of him. And there's lots of unspoken things and things they perhaps on the one hand want to know more about but at the same time don't they'd rather be in denial so it's a really awkward situation and I like that that premise and consequently the narrator keeps having dreams where her father is trying to call her which is why it's called Moshi Moshi which is what you would say when you answer the phone as if he's trying to tell her something or apologize and and I like that ethereal otherworldly feel to this book the narrator's mother moves in with the narrator because she doesn't want to be in a house on her own and there's this great tension between the two because the daughter really wants to grow up and it's like her mother has become the child in the relationship so I thought all of that was really wonderful and I would happily have read a novel all about their relationship and how they were coping with their grief but even though that's where we start it's not where we really head towards it's more about Yoshi the narrator trying to find comfort and solace in men that remind her of her father which I found a very uncomfortable direction for the book to take and I don't think as a reader I was supposed to find it uncomfortable and I have found that in a few Japanese books um some books by Yoko Ogawa with relationships with huge age differences differences and I, I find it a little bit 
unsettling and it's not really my kind of thing so unfortunately that really lowered my enjoyment of this book which was sad but I am going to read Amrita which is another book by Benoni Yoshimoto that I haven't read before and then the other book that I read is a compilation of things so this is the book of Ramallah which is published by Comma Press they have a whole series I think it's their city book series where they will take writers from one particular city and they will highlight stories that they have written and in this case this is loads of different writers with lots of different translators and because it's an anthology of writing um, it means that the enjoyment you're going to get from the stories is probably going to vary quite significantly and that was definitely the case for me. I loved reading stories from and about Palestine and I thought that ver most of these were, were very atmospheric um, some of them were folkloresque, which I really enjoyed. My favourite, I think, was a story called A Tragic Ending, and I liked it because it was very meta. So this one is by Mahmoud Shakir, and it's translated by Thuraya L. Ryers. And this is a story that a man says he's going to write for a woman that he loves, and he's going to give it a tragic ending because that's what he thinks their, their love story should have, because those are the stories that he has in turn heard. So he's mythologizing their lives together, which I thought was interesting. But the really fascinating thing about it is that it's written in the third person, but then there is also another narrator who interrupts the flow with their commentary in brackets, correcting what the narrator is saying. And you can read that as an imagined reader who's doing that, or as this woman that he's writing about, as if she is reading the story that he has written for her and is correcting it. So I love the playfulness and also sometimes sinister element that that brought to the story. I thought that was that was really interesting. So if you haven't checked out Comma Press before and the work that they do, I would really recommend it. Where should we go to next? Okay, let's go here because this is a book I don't want to spend loads of time on. Um, so this is Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me by Kate Clanchy. If you're not in like the book publishing world, um, the book Twitter sphere, you may not have seen the discourse that's been going on about this book this past month. So I'll give a little bit of context in case you haven't. Um, Kate Clanchy is a poet, um, a writer. She's a teacher. She teaches at Oxford Spires Academy. And I've mentioned her before on this channel because I love the work that her students write. Like the kids in her class, what they write is incredible. And she shares their work online. And I am just, just, I love their poetry so very much. And this is a book that came out, I think about 18 months ago. I can't remember exactly, but I want, wanted to read it. So I bought it when it came out. And like lots of books, it sat on my shelf because, you know, there are so many books and, and so little time. So I bought it being really excited to read about her life as a teacher, because this is 30 years of her teaching and what she has learned. And I thought, well, I want to read that because your kid's work is incredible. It's been sitting on my shelf. Then at the beginning of August, Kate was tweeting saying that people were making things up about her book on Goodreads, making up racist quotes and saying they were from her book and then reviewing her book and slating it. And I thought, well, God, I saw that and I thought that that's horrible if people are doing that. But then it became very clear very quickly that that's not what was happening because people replied saying, Kate, all of those things that people are saying are in your book and everyone bought receipts, you know, screenshots of the text. So Kate backtracked and she said, well, all those things are being taken out of context. And I was looking at this and just thinking, I don't see how any of those things that people have screenshotted could be okay in any context. And it wasn't just individual words, it was whole paragraphs. And I thought, this is just this is not okay. And this book has been sitting on my shelf. I've never recommended it before. Like I've hauled it, which is not a recommendation, but it's sitting on my shelf. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to read it so that I do have this context, which she says is lacking. And this is the book that I read. That is the worst book that I have read in years. This is a book that just made me desperately, desperately sad to think that someone who has taught children for 30 years has written this book, which is full of racist language and it's fat phobic and classist, sexist, homophobic, ableist. Um, it's written so insensitively. All of the students, she focuses on what they look like and it's very othering and she centers herself for all of the interactions she has with these kids. And I think that the context, I assume that Kate says that people are missing is at the beginning of this book, she says that everything is written with love, but you, I can't feel that reading this book. I, I cannot feel that love that she says is there. It just, it, it feels like a real, well, it is 
a real strange use of, of power. It's deeply unsettling. There is a scene where she's talking about teaching autistic kids and how much they annoy her. There is a scene where she's talking about one of the girls in her class and how fat she's got and how that really disappoints her and how she has no class aspirations. And it's just, it's just pretty rubbish. And I just think if I read about a teacher of mine writing about me in this way, it would be so demoralizing. And I remember, and I know this is an anecdote that I've shared before, but I remember having my first poem published when I was 11 in a national newspaper. And then our local newspaper came to my school to take my picture. And my English teacher took all the credit for my work. I'm not saying that that's what's happening in, in, in this book. This is just a tangent that I'm going on. But my English teacher tried to take credit for my work, saying that everything I knew about poetry she taught me, which was just false, because I'd had an amazing teacher before her and she'd taken no interest in me at all until I had submitted for this prize on my own and, and had won. And suddenly she was there. And when they came to take my photo, she told me that I should wear gloves because if I was representing the school, people shouldn't see my disability. So she was policing my disabled body and really exerting this this power and opinion over me in a really not very okay way that made me feel so small. And teachers have such an influence over the way that we feel like as children. Um, yeah. So this book is not one that I would recommend. Um, I know that it is being rewritten and Kate has apologised and she says she's learnt a lot and I'm all for people learning. I'm all for that. I just don't understand how this book was written. If you worked with kids for 30 years and this is the book you write, I don't understand how it can be rewritten either because there's pretty much something on every other page. Um, and the rhetoric around it online was just horrible. It was the worst of the publishing industry with prominent white authors jumping on people of colour, especially writers of colour and female writers of colour, shouting at them for for highlighting the problems in this text. Um, and they only did that as well once Kate had lied. I think that was also the thing is that she lied about people making stuff up about things that are in her book and either she'd forgotten that she'd written them or I honestly don't know what the or is. It was just such a, such a strange and bizarre situation. And as I said, I'm all for people learning and growing. But this is a book that should just be pushed, pushed, pushed away, pushed away. So that is what I'm doing to it. Um, okay, so other books that I read, let's move on from that for nicer, nicer things. Let's speak about something nice. Death, <laughs> Death, I read this. This is Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godden. And I actually listened to this one on audiobook. If you can listen to it, please listen to it because Selena is such a performer. I first met her 11 years ago. When I moved down to London, I decided I would throw myself into the poetry scene and I was a naive, uh, how was I, 21 year old going into East London, going to these poetry events and being super, super nervous. And Selena was was like, a, 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 I was gonna call her a, a mother duck or a mother hen, but she's really not like that at all. She's like, everyone's cool and like she was just so fab um, and made me feel really at home and um, got me to read at some of the events that she was doing at the night called the book club boutique and she's just so much fun she did uh, a piece which well, she did loads of pieces but one of them was called the good cock and sometimes i think about that and i just laugh and if you read it on the page it would be nothing but it's the way that she reads it and if you want to listen to her like reading this excellent vulgar story then you can just search for that on youtube careful put her name in because who knows what will come up otherwise but i have such fond memories of those nights of me being terrified and reading poetry and her you know being supportive so this is her debut novel she's written lots of other things poetry memoir this if it's not too much of a uh, a paradox is is like a postmodern Victorian novel. Okay, <laughs> you with me? So this is supposed to be written by a character called Wolf, whose mother passed away in in Grenfell. Grenfell is not named, but it is a tower block that where there was a fire and lots of people died, and um, it's discussed quite a lot in this book. And then Wolf meets 
Mrs. Death, who is a black working class woman who's been around for, for so long and has a sister called Life who she hates because she's so just in your face and really optimistic and just spouting cliches all the time. And Mrs. Death is down to earth and understands life more than life does. This is written in, in many sections like a poem. And that's another reason why I would suggest listening to it. And the reason that I say it feels like a postmodern Victorian book is that there's something very Dickensian about it. And I don't know if it's just because it's set in London. Maybe it's because it's a bit like A Christmas Carol. That's possibly it, where, where death is coming to teach you a lesson and, and talk to you. Except that the life lesson that, that Wolf is being taught is, is not what Scrooge was being taught, which was that you need to better yourself. This is Wolf learning about how, how unfair society is and how society needs to better itself. Society is Scrooge. Society is Scrooge. And that is the realisation that Wolf is having. It darts all over history with Mrs. Death telling Wolf about death. And she tells Wolf about death through the medium of a desk that Wolf has bought. So almost like a, a Ouija board or something. And there's a playfulness regarding the death of the author when we think about that. And I add the postmodern element to it because a lot of this feels reminiscent of Ali Smith. The prologue, very tongue in cheek and reminded me of, of Ali Smith, made me laugh so much. It says, it's, it's almost like a disclaimer for the book you're about to read. This book does not mention every person that has ever died. If you wish this book to have mentioned another death, we can only apologise now in advance for not knowing which death or dead celebrity you wanted mentioned and celebrated in this book of time and writing and printing. At the time of writing, this book mourns for Prince, David Bowie, Leonard Cohen, Toni Morrison and Aretha Franklin. And this book sincerely hopes there aren't any more inspirational human beings, bold souls, brave hearts and superheroes to add to that list before we go to print. Amen. It's really funny, but also heartwarming. I thought it was a delight. A book that was a little bit too delightful for me and one that I have ultimately decided to pass on is one that I have mentioned in a video before because I started reading this a while ago. And I think the writing is amazing, but it's so focused on love as the title would suggest, but kind of happy love and people just being in nice relationships. And I don't enjoy reading about that very much which I think says a lot about me and not about this book. So this is Love and Colour by Bolu Babalola. And if you would like to read some lovely stories about love, then this one is for you and I'm going to find a better home for it. But unfortunately, it's just not for me. Then I read a Nikki French book. Of course I did. So this is The Other Side of the Door. Frustratingly, I had another copy of this. I bought a book called Complicit and then I saw that this existed. And on my quest to read every Nikki French book ever, I thought, there's another book by Nikki French I haven't read. And I bought it, but this is the American edition of Complicit. So I had two copies, so I've given the other one to Jean. This sounded similar in premise to the first Nikki French book I ever read, which was called The Lying Room, which was about a woman who went to a flat where she would go to have an affair with someone that she knew, obviously, because she was having an affair with them. And one day she got there and he was dead and she didn't know what to do. And she thought, if I call the police, then everyone will find out that I was having an affair. So what she decides to do is clean the entire flat and get rid of all the evidence of her and the affair and not call the police. Um, or at least she calls the police as she's leaving. So she ruins the evidence of the crime scene. It's really fascinating. I enjoyed it. So this one, it says on the back, when Bonnie Graham arrives at her boyfriend's apartment in London, she is horrified to discover a dead body in a pool of blood on the floor, but she doesn't call the police. Bonnie hides the corpse and obliterates any evidence that she was there. So you can see why I thought that's quite similar, but actually it's very different because she's not just cleaning the flat to get rid of evidence of herself. She is disposing of the body and she enlists one of her friends to help her do this. But you just don't know what her motivation for this is. Why is she doing this if she didn't kill him and doesn't seem to really know who did kill him? What is going on? So I thought that was really fascinating some of it very far-fetched and silly when they're getting rid of the body, but I think it's supposed to be because they don't know what they're doing and they clearly haven't watched enough crime documentaries, read enough, you know, listened to um, My Favourite Murder. They haven't listened to any of that because they are just not doing themselves any favours. So that was both tension building and hilarious to read. 
they're all in a band together um so they don't actually know each other hugely outside of the context of the band so that made for an interesting premise because it meant there were lots of secrets that you found out about the characters or that they found out about each other the resolution i didn't love and i thought there were some conflicting messages in here about domestic violence which were a little bit odd to read so yes i like this there's not much more I can say about it because it's a mystery thriller and I don't want to give anything away. Not a favourite favourite by them, but it did keep me guessing. I read this picture book called The Sea by Perot Rod, and this is a really nice picture book that is kind of a modern day version of Five Minutes Peace by Jill Murphy, who passed away this month, which is very sad. Um, so this is about the sea who looks after all of her fish. So she is the mother of all the creatures in the sea and she's reading them a bedtime story but they're just being very frustrating and they won't sit still and they won't listen to what she's saying so she decides to leave she decides to get up and become a cloud and she runs away and all the fish fall down to the earth and all the creatures are without water but scientifically that that seems to be oddly okay um so they are trying to work out how they can live without the sea and then they realize they can't really so they yell for her to come back and so she comes back and they live happily ever after and all the children the fish have learned something they've learned to appreciate their mother so i like the message of that um i didn't feel like it was particularly unique i think but i thought the art style was intriguing and, and that bit, I suppose, actually was the unique bit about this. The story, not so much, but the artwork is quite different. So that bit I enjoyed. This is a book that I bought last week and have read and love, and I want to shout about it here because this is a really limited edition print run. So if you want to get your hands on it, you're going to need to do it quickly. So this is The House of Former Lovers, and it's by Kirsty Logan, who you know that I love, and it's illustrated by Maria Stoyan, who did the graphic novel, take it as a compliment. And this is a set of prints, which are amazing alongside seven pieces of flash fiction that Kirsty has written. And I don't wanna show you like everything inside here, obviously, but to give you just a little bit of a sample, this is what the prints look like. They are stunning. Um, so Kirsty has written seven pieces of flash fiction and, and I think each of them focuses on a particular animal and they are magical and dark and surreal and everything that you would expect from her fiction if you have read her work before. My favourite was one called Nanny, Rabbit Nanny, Rabbit Nanny and it reminded me of a short story by Emma Donoghue based on this Victorian um, myth of, of a woman who'd given birth to rabbits and um, so bun uh, Bunny Nanny, Rabbit Nanny is about a nanny and the kids who she cares for are sure that she has rabbits that live under the hem of her skirt and they're trying to spy them when they're out on a walk and they think maybe she is part bunny and they're just really intrigued by her and her, her sternness. So the pieces are really, really short and they're very snappy and I just found it such an enjoyable read. I would highly, highly recommend it. You can only purchase it on Kirsty's website because they put this together themselves. So I'll link that in the description box down below. This book I loved. This is Ghosted by Jen Ashworth. And when I first read the blurb of this novel, I thought, is this going to be a thriller? Because it's about a woman called Laurie who doesn't report her husband missing for five weeks. And after five weeks, she reluctantly goes to the police and she says, hey, uh, my partner Mark has, has disappeared. And when I read that blurb, I thought, oh, you know, is it a mystery? Has she killed him? It's certainly what the police think, because not only has she not reported him missing for five weeks, but she has actively lied about where he is. Whenever Mark's mother has called on the phone or his friends have called, she said he's in the shower because he left his wallet and his phone at home. But this isn't really a mystery thriller. It is a little bit. It's more about their relationship and how they have been existing in entirely different spaces. She uses physical manifestations of space to discuss this because there are different areas of the flat in the flashbacks that she talks about that they occupy. Um, but really it's just showing how they 
are existing on different planes of thought and they're coping with things in their lives really differently and it is in part a ghost story as well they're definitely haunted by various different things i'd say it's a really sad book like it's really sad it got me in the feels it made me cry but it also has tension and warmth to it as well which i found really lovely i was gonna say i was pleasantly surprised by this book but that sounds like i wasn't thinking i was going to enjoy it and it was one of my most anticipated releases of the year i think maybe when i say that i was pleasantly surprised by this book the premise of this book and its execution i think could be handled not that well but this book handled it so well with such grace um and i i thoroughly enjoyed it it's messy and to use a word i hate when people talk about books raw <laughs> but it is like it really is it's painful to read in bits uh, and I think that she really does talk about parts of ourselves that I think even some writers are just scared to write about because it rings a bit too true and a bit too unfattering but she goes there so I would definitely recommend this book and another book that I read last month and loved so much one of my favorite favorite books of the year is Underbelly by Anna Whitehouse and I bought this because I follow Anna on Instagram she runs something called Flex Appeal where she's campaigning for um, flexible working hours especially to benefit women and childcare arrangements and, and all of that stuff and I just think she's wonderful and I never read her writing before she she writes and she has a radio show she's a tv presenter she does so many different things um but I just was intrigued by the premise of this and she wrote this with her husband Matt they wrote it together always intrigued by a husband and wife writing duo and I thought you know what I'm, I'm gonna give this a go. I bought it, I think the first Saturday of August, and I read it on the Sunday in one day. Like, I could not put this book down. This is very reminiscent, and I don't mean that it feels like it's copied from it, I just mean if you're a fan of this thing, you will love this book. It's very reminiscent of the TV sitcom Motherland. I would say slightly less funny because it's very dark and twisted, but it does have those funny moments. This is about two women called Dylan and Lo, um, and they are people who would probably never be friends with each other if they just met each other, but their kids become really good friends at school. So they meet at the school gates and they therefore become friends by proxy. They, they have to exist in each other's spaces. They have very different backgrounds. Um, Dylan is is working class and Lo is definitely middle class and they both use social media but in very different ways. Dylan has a blog that she's been writing and Lo is is an influencer. She uses Instagram, it is her job, she is is hired to promote clothes and all of this stuff. And I'm always a little bit apprehensive about reading about commentaries of social media from people who don't really understand social media there was a lot of commentary around um that documentary the social dilemma which was about social media and a lot of the people they were interviewing didn't have social media accounts had never had social media accounts and were just shouting about how the internet was the devil and there are loads of downsides to the internet and to social media absolutely but there are also so many positive things about it as well and it's very rare to find a balanced account of online life but Anna, as I said, she has a platform and she does understand social media. And that was what made this book so wonderful, is that she was able to dissect it from the inside and talk about some of the really terrifying things to do with social media and Instagram and, and having a platform. Um, she goes into the, the underbelly world of the internet, the gossip forums and trauma dumping and there is just so much going on in this book but it's also so fast paced and um just brilliant storytelling so i was gonna say if you exist online in any kind of way which i think you do because you're watching this video then please do read this book big big content warning for baby loss um there's also one ableist slur in here as well um, which i found quite shocking to read but it is coming from a character who we're supposed to hate like this that's saying not very nice things um but i'm just gonna throw that out there too one of the best books i have read this year full stop it's fab another book that i read last month and loved is this which i think i don't think i have heard a bad review of this book this is transcendent kingdom by yajasi she is the author of homegoing and i i love this so much because it really 
zooms in, whereas Homegoing was was epic in its scale of what it was attempting to do, going through so many generations of people. This is pausing on, well, still a couple of generations, but one family and one specific series of moments in their lives whilst delving back into their past. And it is such an intentional novel. Everything about this book is precise. And as a writer reading this, I was just wanted to applaud all the time because everything is in the place that it should be in, which I know sounds like such a basic thing to say, but you know when you just read a book and and you know that this author has, has planned this exquisitely and they have tweaked it in every way that they want to. They have taken their time and they have enjoyed taking their time and it sings out through the pages. This is a novel about a young woman called Gifty who is performing experiments on mice. So just so you know that that's what she's doing. She's performing experiments on mice as part of the work that she's doing to understand why animals and people are gluttons for punishment. Why do we do this to ourselves? If we know something is bad for us, but we once got enjoyment from it, why do we keep going back to it time and time again? And she's doing this to look into addiction and she's powered and fueled to do that because of the relationship that she had with her brother who who was an addict and through this she is trying to create some kind of solution to offer up to herself but also to her mother who is so broken from what happened to their family and what happened to her brother this is her way of coping with grief it's through science and she's tried so many different ways of coping with grief she's tried religion which she hasn't abandoned but she's she's darting between spiritual and biological and trying to marry those two things together to find um a recipe that works for her i think in in that respect it feels like she's creating some kind of of potion between lots of different modes of practice something and a place where she can exist and, and thrive and grow. And I think all of that imagery of religion and science that's woven throughout this book is, is brilliant. We're nearly at the end now. One book that I sadly did not enjoy at all is a book that's been sitting on my shelf for a while. Do you, and I'm sure that many of you have, a book on your shelf that you bought and you envisage reading it at a particular time of year. So this is Speaking of Summer by Kalisha Buchanan. And I bought this a few years ago and thought, I want to read it over summertime because it's got summer in the title. <laughs> you can read those at any time of year, but I was just so adamant I was going to read it during the summer one time and summer rolled around and then left several times and I hadn't got around to it. And I thought this year I must read it during the summer because it's getting embarrassing now. So I read it and unfortunately it's not a book that was, that was for me at all. This is a novel about a young girl called Autumn who is trying to find her sister Summer who's gone missing. The police aren't really interested and they're not interested because they say there isn't enough evidence but also because it's a young black girl who's gone missing and the judicial system and the police system is very racist. I thought the discussion on that was really excellent in this book but the actual narrative storyline surrounding the characters was really lacking for me and also fell into this massive predictable trope. Um, you can tell that there's going to be a twist and if you have read enough books about twin sisters, then you're probably gonna work out what that twist is. And I just found that a big letdown for me because it felt as though that was the key thing that was supposed to keep me going throughout. But because I'd guessed it, it just wasn't hooking me anymore. I found the writing style a little bit clumsy as well. Um, I would be really keen to read more from this author in the future but this book unfortunately wasn't executed brilliantly for me um, and then finally the last book that I read is Greek Myths which is by my lovely pal Jean so you know I'm biased but um, Jean wrote this for DK um, I'm sure that many of us in the UK grew up with non-fiction DK books um, in our houses, in our schools, in our libraries, um, teaching us about skeletons and the human body and, and history. I think I had one on the Egyptians that I used to get out from the library all the time. So this is one that she wrote for them about Greek myths and it's illustrated by Katie Ponder. And I really needed to, you know, sharpen up on my Greek myth knowledge. I know that I know loads of things about fairy tales. I am the fairy tale person. And I, often people think that that means that I know loads of things about Greek myths 
but I really don't. And it's the same with Jean and fairy tales. We kind of have to pull our knowledge together sometimes. Um, so it was really good to refresh some of my knowledge on, on Greek mythology. I know quite a lot of stories, but I don't know all of them. And there are just so many, there are so many gods, you know, there are just, there are just so many. Anyway, um, let me give you a quick flick through. Can you see? It's just so beautiful. Every page is illustrated. So she talks about the uh, gods and goddesses, creation myths and stories to do with the gods. Then she talks about heroes and creatures of mythology. And I just think it's a wonderful gift, especially for, I don't know, middle grade, nine to 12, I would say. But you know, for adults like me who want to brush up on their Greek myth knowledge, this was lovely. Um, so I think those are all of the books that I read in August. Some high highs, some low lows, and pretty much everything in between. I will list all of the books that I've mentioned in the description box down below. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if you're keen to pick any of them up now that I've spoken about them. If you're new to this channel, it would mean a lot if you could subscribe. If you would like to support this channel over on Patreon, that would also be amazing. There's a link to that in the description box down below. I hope you're having a great week and I will speak to you very soon. Sending love. Bye.